I based this checklist very much on Scott Weingart's work over at MCRIT. Scott is a physician over in the States and you can find his wonderful website at www.mcrit.org where he has lots of fabulous resources. I have adapted the checklist slightly as some of it is aimed at the medical thinking process before intubation which is outside the scope of this course. The first thing to say about the checklist is that it must be readily available. It's no use having a checklist which must then be printed out. In a stressful, time-critical situation, this makes no sense at all, so have a laminated copy attached to the airway trolley would be my advice. This could even be made to something that fits in one's pocket. The checklist itself is broken down into four sections. Plan, patient prep, equipment and team. Plan is broken down into induction agent stroke muscle relaxant, post-tube analgesia sedation, push dose epi, fail plan verbalization and crike evaluation. Induction agent muscle relaxant. So remember we talked about some different choices for the induction agent and muscle relaxants. We need to ensure that these are prepared, well labeled and accessible. Different practitioners may want different drugs depending on the situation and this needs to be made clear. It should be clear what sedative is going to be used, which muscle relaxant and which vasopressor stroke inotrope may also be required. The dose should be checked before the process begins, in other words as part of the checklist. Ideally the amount should be standardised so that there is always 20 mls of propofol and 10 mls of rocuronium, for example. Post-tube analgesia stroke sedation. Once you have successfully intubated the patient, you need to ensure that they stay sedated and pain-free. The initial intubating doses of the sedative will wear off quite quickly, and post-intubation you might have other jobs to do to get the patient ready. You do not want them coughing on the tube or moving about, this will stress them and you. So, have your post-procedure drugs ready before you start. Ideally, you should already have them in the syringe drivers and attached to the patient if you have the access. This way you can start them at the earliest opportunity. Push dose epinephrine. Are you going to be using this possibly? Is your patient unstable? Have you been asked to prepare it? Does the practitioner want it? These questions are answered by having this as part of your checklist. You may not want it, but you should ask the question. You do not want your patient's pressure crashing and then go looking for it. Failed airway plan verbalised. Part of the intubation algorithm should include what you're going to do if you cannot intubate the patient. Plan B. Will you come out, rebag and try again? Will you hand over to someone more experienced? Will you try to use a supraglottic device? Whatever you choose to do, you should communicate this to the rest of the team so that they can be ready for it. Surprises are not good for anyone in this situation. Crike evaluation. Has there been discussion of the option to perform an emergency cricothyroidotomy? Has the practitioner assessed the position of the cricothyroid membrane? Is the equipment available or visible so that we know where it is if needed? If the airway is anticipated to be a difficult one, then we should have the crike site marked and the kit by the bedside. Patient prep. This is broken down into denitrogenated for greater than three minutes, nasal cannula, apneic oxygenation, oxygenated to 95% possibly using CPAP, looking in the mouth, checking the dentures and the neck movement, positioning, pulse oximetry visible or audible, access reliable and tested. So denitrogenated for greater than three minutes. In order to give the practitioner greater time to place the tube, it is important that the patient's functional residual capacity is washed out of the nitrogen it contains and that this is replaced by oxygen. This can be done by placing a well-fitting mask over the patient's face for more than three minutes or asking them to take several deep breaths if they are able. Nasal cannula apneic oxygenation it has also been shown that applying nasal oxygen at a high flow rate will also reduce the time to desaturation without compromising the seal of the mask and therefore the denitrogenation process. If it does, the nasal cannula can be placed ready on the patient's forehead to be pulled down once they are sedated. It has also been shown through the THRIVE trial 
that heated high flow nasal oxygen can be useful here. Oxygenated to 95%, possibly using CPAP. If necessary, try using CPAP to get those SATs up to 95%. Or even a BVM with a CPAP valve might achieve it. Look in the mouth, check the dentures, range of neck movement. Check out the teeth. Are there any which might cause problems with the laryngoscope, such as loose or malpositioned ones? If the patient has dentures, leave them in initially, as this will make it easier to form a seal when trying to pre-oxygenate them. Take them out when about to intubate. Assess the neck movement. Remember, as well as ear to sternal notch, you will need to extend the neck to get the optimum view when looking for the cords. If you can't move the neck for many reasons, then that will make the process more difficult and you need to be prepared for that. Positioning. Ears to sternal notch and face parallel to the ceiling is the best position for viewing the airway with the laryngoscope. Pulse ox visible or audible. Personally, I don't like people telling me what the SATs are doing unless I ask them. I feel it puts pressure on me when I'm already stressed. I do need to know what those SATs are, however, so it's important that I can either see them myself or someone else can that will be able to let me know. The rate of decline of saturations increases the lower those SATs are with the inflection point where they start to drop quickly being at about 93%. It's certainly crucial that we ensure that the probe is on the patient and reading correctly before we start. Access, reliable and tested. If possible, there should be two routes of access, venflons probably, as big as possible and as central as possible, and ensure that they've both been flushed. It is wise to have a bag of fluid attached to one of them to act as a flush and to ensure that the line will remain patent throughout the procedure. If you can't get access, it might be that either a central line is considered or intraosseous might be your last option. Equipment. This is broken down into kit dump on table, BVM on oxygen, waveform capnograph on BVM, laryngoscope, stroke backup scope, stroke video laryngoscope, suction, ET tube, bougie, subglottic airway. Kit dump on the table. It's a big mistake to have equipment in various places around the patient, on the bed, by the pillow, or on the bedside table, for example. Get all your equipment in the same place lined up in the order you plan to use it. This will also make it easier to check that you have everything you need. Bag valve mask on oxygen. Ensure that you are connected to oxygen with the flow turned to at least 15 litres per minute. Make sure that the face mask is in an appropriate size and provides a good seal. Ensure that you are using a good technique to get that seal or that you are working as a team of two if that is what it takes. Remember the Thena Eminence technique might be the better one. Waveform Capnograph on the bag valve mask. Waveform capnography is the gold standard now for ensuring that the patient has been intubated correctly. It has shown to be reliable and will be the first thing the practitioner will check to confirm that they have the ET tube in the correct place. As they bag post intubation, they will get a good return on the waveform as the patient blows out their carbon dioxide. It is better to have it attached to the BVM as then it won't be forgotten about when attaching the BVM to the ET tube once intubation has taken place. There are many great resources out there for learning about capnography, but the one I recommend most is www.capnography.com. Laryngoscope, backup scope, video laryngoscope. Have you got the right laryngoscope? Does it work? Has anyone checked it? Do you have a backup in case your first one fails? Many units now also have access to video laryngoscopy and it is important that it is easily available and you know how to operate it. Is it clean and does it work? Plug it in. Suction. Once checked for, this is a piece of equipment that does need to be near the patient's head. The habit of many practitioners is to check that it is connected and working and then tuck it under the pillow of the patient, readily accessible if they need it. This must be available as it may be the first thing the practitioner will need to ensure they have a clear view of the airway and to help minimise any aspiration during the procedure. ET tube, 
bougie, supraglottic airway. It's important to be sure which size ET tube we are going to use. Once that decision has been made, then that tube needs to be readied. So out of the pack, cuff inflated to ensure that it is intact, then deflated and the end of the tube should have lubricant applied to allow for a smoother passage. There should also be a tube one size smaller to hand. It may be that the patient has an airway which is narrower than expected and it is difficult to get the tube past the cords. In this case, the practitioner may then want a smaller ET tube to get through those cords. Many practitioners now will start with a bougie rather than ask for one once they have failed once. I know from experience that the less able practitioner should always be ready to use the bougie. This also needs to be out of its wrapper and ready to use. Ensure you know which end is which. The bent, flexible tip is the one the practitioner will be putting in the mouth. The Difficult Airway Society will have you move on to the use of a supraglottic device fairly quickly if the intubation becomes difficult. So this must also be to hand. The size needed to be verified and syringe available to inflate the cuff should it be used. Team. This is divided into role awareness, skills check, are we ready? Role awareness. There will be several people involved in the process. Do they all know what they are there for? Is someone going to be able to give the drugs when required? Do they know that? Is someone going to hand you the equipment? Do they know that and do they know the order in which you are likely to want it? Is someone doing cricoid pressure for you? Do they know that? Is there someone more experienced to help you if you get into difficulties? Skills check. An intubation can be a stressful environment and preparing for one will often get the adrenaline flowing. It is at this point that you need to be sure that the people in their roles can do what you ask them to. One of the common problems is that someone asked to do cricoid is not actually sure of the landmarks or the pressure needed. Sometimes they can make the whole process much more difficult. Make it clear to everyone that you would rather know if they do not know how to do something. Someone else can do it and you can teach them later. Are we ready? If we have run through the checklist properly, then we should be, but everyone should be aware that we are going to start. Verbalise this to the whole team. Is everyone ready? Get an answer from everyone, then let them know we are starting.